for a long time now, we've been part of what is maybe the largest experiment in Christian history, certainly the most sudden. Almost in an instant, we have created something called virtual church, a thing never done before, at least not in this way or for these reasons. We are still the church. We still gather on Sunday. We still study how the claims of our faith are supposed to shape our lives. And we still work to hold each other accountable to that standard. We still love each other. In many of our churches, our ministries of service to the needy and the hurting continue. They look different, but they continue. We still have church schools. We still have vestry meetings. Oh my gosh, you know that must mean if we're having vestry meetings, we're still the church. But even with all that, it isn't real somehow. Yes, we've been able to gather in person at least some of the time. But then the virus chases us back home behind our closed doors and in front of these screens. Yes, we are still the church, but in so many ways, for so long now, our experience of each other, really of everything, has lacked depth. It's as though we are living in an unreal time. Luke's Gospel doesn't have a lot of stories about what happens after Easter morning. In fact, it has only two stories, and they're linked in an important way. The first is a story we all treasure, the story of the disciples on the Emmaus Road, and the moment of revelation over that shared meal. And then there's the story we heard this morning. The only account Luke gives us of time spent between Jesus and the apostles after the resurrection. In fact, they're two parts of the same story. Those same two followers of Jesus who realized suddenly that they were eating with Jesus in Emmaus, they've run the seven miles back to Jerusalem that night to tell the 11 apostles who remain what had happened to them. The connection between those two stories is made clear if we put back in some words that were cut out of the beginning of the gospel lesson this morning. The whole text reads, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Now think just a moment about the beginning of each story. In the first story, those two followers of Jesus are headed to Emmaus. They fetch up with a stranger. They're dejected and despondent, and he asks them why. They wonder what rock this stranger has been living under. But they explain to him, and they make plain the reason that they're sad. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, they tell him. All these things had happened, and now they wondered, was any of it real? We were so hopeful. We believed so much. And then we saw such brutality, such awful suffering. Was Jesus really who we thought he was? Those same two disciples are now in a room with the 11 others. And even after Jesus appears to them, here are the ways Luke describes them. They were startled and terrified. In their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. These are people who had been with Jesus all along. And yet they're sad and have lost hope They're startled and terrified. They're hesitant and wondering. Doesn't that sound like the whole world around us now? A whole year of virtual church might be making us wonder more than we'd like. Is God real anymore? Was God ever real? Is all of this just somehow virtual? And if we're thinking that, we who have prayed together and sung together and cried together and struggled so hard to keep our community together, how much more must people outside the church be struggling to imagine anything beyond a virtual kind of God? This morning's gospel message is about how God acts to address exactly that questioning, exactly that doubt. And it teaches us something about how we 
as the bearers of God's message, have to bring that message into a world that is now filled with fear and doubt. And it's just this. Jesus stops trying to talk people into believing that he's real, and he shows them how real he is. He finally gets that what they need to see is that he's right in the world with them. And so he asks the same question our teenage children would ask when they come home. Have you got anything here to eat? Jesus enters right into their doubts and fears, right into their terror and their hesitancy, not by brilliant teaching or by beautiful liturgy, but by just sitting down and eating with them, the simplest, most human thing of all. There's a whole world around us wondering where the love of God that we keep talking about disappeared to for this past year. There's a whole culture around us prepared to point to all the suffering and sorrow and death and loss of this past year as evidence of the folly of our beliefs. They haven't had eyes to see that God's love has been abundantly expressed in the bravery and selflessness of caregivers, the tenacity of scientists, the sacrifices of parents, the compassion of nurses. They're wondering whether not just the church, but God is just virtual. And we really can't blame them because they are sad and dejected. Their hopes have been hurt. They've been terrified and frightened just like that room of disciples. We can hardly expect that they'd be any different. Jesus gives us a pretty clear model of how to be disciples in that room and in this world. We have to share the basic stuff of life with people who are hurting and not just give it to them, but enter into it with them. We have to show them that God is real by showing them that we are real. And to do that, we have to really enter into their world. And then, maybe, but only then, can we do the work of opening minds and sharing faith. We are so eager to get back into the comfort and safety of the church. But if Jesus had done the same, he'd have never appeared to the disciples. And we would still be wondering, was any of that real? Or was it just virtual? That doubt is swept away, not by theological reasoning, not by eloquent preaching, but by relationships and shared meals. The simple, real stuff of life. We believe in no virtual God. We believe in a God that is so real that he walked and taught, wept and laughed, bled and died, and overcame the doubts of terrified, frightened people by eating with them. That God can work through us in this world and has chosen us to be those workers. Pretty soon, it will be time for us to get to work.